able to actually keep something unchanged, it lets you know just how important, how paramount it is, that this particular status quo remains intact. How important it is to those who are keeping it intact. And I'm talking now about the West's relationship with Africa. Because the West's economic relationship with Africa has not fundamentally changed in over 800 years. This is absolutely stunning. If the drastic and rapid changes that can occur and have occurred within the West uh, over just one or two decades, if that's breathtaking, well, what about the fact that nothing has changed between the West and Africa in basically a millennium? I mean, the relationship was ruthlessly extractive 800 years ago, and it's ruthlessly extractive now. And you can't help but recognize that keeping things this way simply must not only be important to the West, but literally it must be the most important thing to the West. It's so important to them that they have always maintained this status quo no matter what else changes in the world. Wallahi, they're dedicated to the subjugation and the exploitation of Africa more than they're dedicated to anything else. Everything else is allowed to change except for this. This must never change. And it's not difficult to see why. I mean, it's the subjugation and the exploitation of Africa that has enabled the West to impersonate a superior civilization. It's like a con man, you know, a drifter who tries to convince people that he's some sort of an aristocrat or a monarch or something. Well, he needs to have some kind of a display of, uh, of a monarch's wealth in order to be convincing. And that's been the whole basis for uh, what the West claims about itself being superior. The whole basis has always been that they're materially successful. So, okay, today you have iPhones and technology, you have a high standard of living and so forth. So that means that you must be better. You must be more intelligent. You must be more evolved. You must be more civilized, more advanced than the rest of us. I mean, look how nice their places are. See how much better their stuff is. Well, this is all reliant upon the vicious pillage and plunder of Africa. Without this subjugation, uh, without this exploitation of Africa, Europe and the West would be nothing but crude, emaciated serfs barely producing enough to survive. Their wealth was primarily derived from theft and plunder, from piracy and slavery, from mass murder and crime. This is just a historical reality. Because of the subjugation of Africa, first through chattel slavery, the extraction of Africa's human resources, and now through the extraction of natural resources, uh, the West uh, has been able to maintain this artificial, unearned status as a so-called civilization. Keeping Africa subject, subordinate, suppressed, and impoverished is an existential need for the West. It's the only way that they can keep up the pretense of their supremacy. Because again, uh, the pretense of their supremacy has never been based upon any actual advancement, any actual sophistication, any actual moral or intellectual development. It has always been based on the violent accumulation of wealth and resources, upon brute power, deceit and conniving. And Africa, the, the, the subjugation of Africa, is the most vital necessity for keeping this con going. I mean, right now, the trade relationship between the West and Africa is that something like 70% of exports to Africa from the West are manufactured goods, and imports from Africa are just the raw materials used to make those manufactured goods. So they're taking from Africa what is needed in order to produce goods uh, that then Africa buys from the West, made with their own raw materials. And the West has done everything possible to try to impede Africa's ability to build its own manufacturing base so that they could potentially use their own raw materials, use their own raw minerals to produce their own goods. I mean, the whole process should be done in-house. It should all be done in Africa. That's what makes sense. You know, you have the materials, you have the minerals, you can make the products. That's how it should be. Rather than giving your uh, raw natural resources to the West uh, for them to manufacture and refine and process and so on, Africa could do all of those things themselves. I mean, imagine the impact that would have. Where would that leave the West then? Well, they know that. The West knows that. They're acutely aware uh, of their actual total dependence upon Africa. If Africa manufactured, uh, if they used their own resources, uh, their own minerals, their own materials, for their own industries, well, the entire economy of the West would collapse. And with the collapse of their economy, their whole so-called civilization would collapse. A Africa is the foundation upon which they built their house. So they know this. 
And like I said, this is why no matter what else changes in the world, no matter how power dynamics shift in the world, uh, the subjugation of Africa uh, has been maintained for over 800 years. There's literally nothing more important to them than this. And this is why there are very powerful factions in the West that want to destroy BRICS and why they fear monger about uh, Chinese investment in Africa and why America specifically is engaged in non-stop interference, covert operations, regime change, uh, regime infiltration projects all across the continent. I mean, look at uh, South Africa, the ANC, either out of uh, naivete or corruption or naivete that devolved into corruption, or out of coercion, or some combination of all of these factors, uh, the ANC collaborated with neoliberal programs uh, for 30 years. I mean, to one degree or another, for the last 30 years. But as global power dynamics have been shifting, uh, and the creation and the ascendancy of BRICS has been taking place, people have started to have aspirations. And more importantly, uh, they've started to have options. And those options... Uh, have made their aspirations actually achievable. I'm talking about aspirations of political independence, aspirations of economic sovereignty, aspirations of getting out from under the yoke of the West. Welcome back to Breakdown Friday, Joseph Ward, Professor Carl Tone Jones, Patrick Irvin. We are here breaking down uh, this gentleman's, this gentleman giving his overview of how the West, the Western powers, used and still needs African resources to become the Western power, to maintain itself as Western powers and as a need to keep Africa and its descendants, I would add in, and its diaspora at a subservient level for labor, land, and resources. And, you know, we talk about it all the time about how the West became the powerhouse it is by an accumulation of money, power, resources, and land. Right. Mm -hmm. So this this guy basically went in on that. So this is what we break it down. This is what we're getting into. We talk about some historical stuff that we should know, but getting into the implications of it to this very day. So uh, hey, uh PC man, you looking real studious out there, man. <laughs> I am. <laughs> so, uh, and, and we're gonna go ahead and, and cook early, man. So, what are your thoughts on what the gentleman was saying about the, Europe's relationship to Africa, and you know the need for the oh, the suppression of Africa, the oppression of Africa, the need of the extraction of resources for the West to be the West? Well, Europe is as Europe does, so. Okay. <laughs> this is Europeans, man. So I think about the mafia, right? The Italian mafia. Not just the Italian mafia, but, you know, European rackets and period. period. I think about how when they go to uh, businesses in their local communities and they tell them that you need, a protect you need protection. So yeah. they have to start paying for protection. Yeah. And if they can't afford the protection, then they often say, well, let's become partners. And what they eventually do is take over that, 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 uh, those people's businesses and so forth. So that's just a microcosm of how Europe operates with the rest of the world, how Europeans operate from the rest of the world. And it's always been done so from a place of, of uh, what do they call it? Um, a, place, a place where... You don't necessarily we, a place where you have to a place of survival, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm not saying they they they. So when you operate from a place, it's it's the saying that you operate. You you can tell a person that comes from a home of love and a and a, and a home where they had to scratch and survive for the existence. And when you think about where Europeans come from, there's not a lot of resources. There's not a lot of food options. So they had to scratch and claw for everything. And so they took that same mentality to the rest of the world. And it creates a certain type of savagery amongst you. And that type of savagery is what has how they impose themselves in the rest of the world. Uh, you, you have all these different stories of when Europeans, um, the Spanish, when their country was in debt, they solicited pirates in America, in the Caribbean. The British did the same thing. 
And so that's when, like, the whole series, the Pirates of the Caribbean, that's where it comes from. When you think about the, the pillaging of Africa and Africans, the resources, it's always been about draining Africa to maintain the, not just the survival of, of Europe, but the indoctrination of white supremacy. That, in fact, like the, the whole notion of Columbus sailing west was about find it wasn't about finding a new trade route to India that people keep talking about. It was because they had learned of a new of a place where they thought that they can plunder gold. Mm-hmm. That's why they went on that journey. And it mm-hmm. was financed. Christopher Columbus was Italian, but it was financed by the, the, the king and queen of Spain. Mm-hmm. Looking for Preston. Yeah. Preston John. Yeah. So when you think about the African slave trade, which was an edict given out by the Pope in like, it was like 1200 AD, somewhere around there, the, the, to, to start for, for the, uh, what was it, the Portuguese, right? Was it Portuguese, when I'm mistaken? Yeah, wait, because remember, uh, they, they spent time, um, before the slave trade, they spent time going up and down the west coast of Africa. Um, right. Plundering and and they brought back some slaves and stuff and that's where they kind of kicked off the idea of to to raid the western part of Africa, right? So because they never really went inland. Let's just be clear about that. They never made it inland. Yeah. So, but you, you think about that, right? So officially, unofficially, slave trade started, especially in America, and the what well, they, they 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 try to state. 1619 that wasn't 1619 it's prior to that and then you have the end of the transatlantic slave trade that was the 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 british had declared the end in like 1812 but Mm -hmm. you go you fast forward and they're still doing it by the way but you fast forward now that they're no longer taking people out of africa you get to the berlin conference in which Mm -hmm. all the nations of Europe converged into Berlin to determine, I believe it was Austria at the time, it wasn't even Germany yet, the, to determine how they were going to carve up Africa. And then they declared war on the entire continent. The only country in Africa that maintained its borders at that time was Ethiopia. Every other country was invaded, had their borders changed, and then began the extraction of resources, most notably King Leopold of Belgium, you know, (laughs) right, where over 15 million documented Africans were murdered because of uh, the plundering that took place, the rubber trees and all that. So, yeah, right. Super proud. So, So, when we look at the predatory relationship with Africa, Good, good use only of way you can continue, huh? It's a good use of word, <laughs> predatory relationship. Yes. The only way you can look at it from that perspective is it's like the creepy uh the creepy uncle that you gotta you you can't, you know, that he has access to the entire house and all the kids gotta hide. You know what I'm saying? Africa is the children, but we gotta maintain, make sure that they stay children. So we have to make sure that we operate from a place of domination and control in Africa. So therefore, we're going to operate coups. We're going to utilize our secret government and our secret militaries and uh, secret political partners in those particular places and maintain that domination of Africa so that they can continue to extract. Because we just saw last year when Nigeria threatened to stop uh, giving uh, resources to to France, we realized that if it wasn't for the extraction of the of the uh I believe it was plutonium or some it was something that some resource that, that Nigeria had yeah. that half of France would half of France would be in darkness. They wouldn't have power. They, they couldn't power their power. And they're paying some kind of crazy amount of money, like millions, almost billions of dollars, maybe billions of dollars a year to France. Yeah, so and France did the same thing. Uh, it, uh, France did the same thing to Haiti. 
right? Sued them, and and, and Haiti had to pay for what uh, over a hundred years. They had to pay retrib- They had to pay, ironically enough, they had to pay reparations to France for their free reparations. So, <clears throat> so, okay. So, okay. I, I, so I'll land it there. No, so let me let me be <clears throat> let me be a devil's advocate for because I want to do this and kind of give some kind of pushback from the other side because I want people to really understand what's going on. All right, so I'm a I'm a part of a, a group of people who we went to war with ourselves. We dominated ourselves. We oppressed ourselves. We suppressed ourselves. We extract whatever resources we had from ourselves, and we did it to anybody else that we came across. Why are y'all any different? And why should we care? Oh, they shouldn't care. The people they're doing it to should care. Right. And that's the problem, though, because we have people who are bought and, bought and paid and, and, sell, and sold out. And they sell out for pennies to the dollar just because for whatever, and I'm not going to get into the psychological reasons why, but for the most part, you, you know, you don't have, you have no civic pride, no national pride when you, when you operate like this and this is who they go for. And these are the people. And plus when you have access to the military and you can actually make people disappear, people who stand up, don't, you know, we think, we think this the epigenetic fear that, that courses through the veins of many black people in America as stay in power. You go over there in Africa and the epigenetic sphere of seeing the fact that many of the ones who are leading liberation struggles and, and le- leading liberation movements to liberate and free those countries, they were slaughtered. Their people were slaughtered. And so you don't think that that plays in the backs of the minds of a lot of people over there. <clears throat> now, there's another caveat to this. It is because we're hypocritical. We enjoy the fruits of that labor. All of our, we, we, listen, we're tech geeks. And this country is full of tech geeks. You know, I'm team, somebody's team Samsung, somebody's team iPhone. Well, the things that make those phones pop. You know, the coltan and all the precious resources and minerals that are pretty much found in only two places in the world. You know, we benefit from that. Great point. Great point. So another pushback from the standpoint of the devil's advocate. So because like like you said in the video, so if if you all are going or if black people are going to. They're going to enjoy the spoils of the of the European riches. They're going to indulge in the spoils of the European riches. Like you said, they're going to extract the resources from Africa, refine them, make them into whatever little devices, whatever, sell them back to Africa, and Africans are going to use them and use them as status symbols. So if that's going to happen, why should the African complain about the oppression? Mm. <laughs> Because it's it's more it's a lot more sophisticated than that, right? And so the African, the brothers and sisters who happen to be in the village, they don't have any say so in regards to those the power brokers that control the uh, the comings and goings of those societies. Mm-hmm. They're pretty much they they don't even have. Like a lot of those brothers and sisters would like to come to America, but they don't qualify for a visa. A lot of those brothers and sisters are trying to escape those places. They can't go nowhere. They're locked in. Now, and I so you have the upper crust who benefit, the haves that benefit, and then you have a lot of have nots that have no say so and feel as though they have no power, and they've been suppressed in many ways. You know what I'm saying? So I believe that there probably are those over there who are complaining about it because they're the ones losing families. The Congo lose millions of people every every so every so many years in those mines. Young people, children in those mines. They the um in uh Nigeria, the big cities seem to function just fine. But the villages 
are often worried about somebody coming in there and snatching their children and turning them into weaponized, you know, soldiers and so forth. And that is not just there in Yemen, uh, Ghana, Kenya, all the different, you know, the, the different spots in Africa. Do you have where you have a potential American made, CIA made, foreign aid warlord coming in there? He also spoke on something too. He spoke on America trying to disrupt the Chinese influence mm -hmm. in Africa. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty much why, you know, the world war, every world war has been fought over Africa. In some way, some form. Even the first World War I was fought because Austria felt like they got shortchanged at the Berlin Conference. That's that was the start of World War I. So the Chinese. It's like they say, they say some people rule with an iron fist and some people feel the need to put a glove on the iron fist. The Chinese are the ones who put the glove, the velvet glove on the iron fist. They're not friends of Africa either. No, no. And this is this is the reality we need to live with and understand. We have to stop being children in the world. Nobody is going to be your friend politically unless they have something to gain from you. And more times than not, they're not going to operate in good faith because they're always trying to get the best part of the deal. Say that again. Say that first part again. Say that first part again. Why, why they won't be allies with you. Say it again. Because they're trying to get the best part of the deal. They're trying to get over. So they're not going to operate in good faith. That has never been policy. You've never seen a fair trade. You have never seen a handshake where both sides are satisfied with the deal. One side is extremely satisfied. The other side is pissed off, but uh, I don't have the power to do anything much. So I'm going to shake your hand. Power. Look, and in Africa, they're look, afraid of their own power. That's what the world has always been about. Who can gain and maintain power? And those who can't will remain on the bottom. Pat, to get you in here, man. So what do you think about the clip? And also, what do you think made Africa so vulnerable to the West? Uh, what, what I think about the clip? Um, I don't really care about the clip. I'm being <laughs> <laughs> I really don't. Uh, and this is why I say. Because from the scale of the scope of the conversations we have, there's nothing new presented in the clip. Right. And then um, there are a lot of things happening in the clip that I would love to delve into, but that I also understand we just aren't in a position culturally as a people to have the necessary conversation. The whole start of the group clip of being that the West needs Africa. Well, you know, like that's not just the West. Like we're talking about a continent. I, I go back there. Like we're talking about a continent. Um, The world needs this continent. Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of people believe that human humanity started on this continent. Like this continent is native modern homo, uh, homo sapien birthplace for a lot of people. And there are other theories that suggest that it's not. That's cool. I'm not knocking that. I'm talking about the people that believe that. Um, but in that, I think we got to get out of it because it's not like as a continent, the world needs all of the continents. So we go there with it, but then like we start talking about the exploitation of this continent, this continent with thousands of people, thousands of cultures, thousands of languages, thousands of religions. And so I, I've developed this thing where when I hear people talking about Africa as if it's a nation, I just kind of zone tone out. Like I just kind of like stop listening at that point. Cause you say, okay, how and it goes into your second question of repeat your second question for me. 
what made what do you think made Africa so vulnerable? That in exactly. I just want to make sure I heard you correctly. It goes right into that. What made Africa so vulnerable is the fact that it's a continent with over 57 different countries on it. Thousands of different religions, thousands of different languages, cultures. Um, you know, you got Morocco, Algeria, you got Angola, Zambia, you got all these different nations all spread out all over the place. Chad, uh, Niger, Nigeria, you got all of these places and we talk about them as if they're all one place with one people and one language. And like, even when he talked about, they go into Africa, they buy the raw materials and then they sell them back to Africa. Name me one nation in Africa that has all the raw materials you need to build. So if I go into a continent and I make a deal with this nation and then I make a deal with that nation and then I make a deal with this other nation over here and I take all the resources that I gather from all the nations and I build something. And so now we're oversimplifying African culture, African societies, African economic systems. We're simple. We're, we're simplifying. We're infantilizing the, na- the, the continent with the discussion. Because we can't get into the nuances of what is actually happening. It's a lot more complicated than the West is going into Africa and taking all their resources. And those Africans should know better. Why won't they stick together? Well, maybe they don't stick together because the Nigeria don't think, talk, or believe the same as the America. Could, could that be possibly a, just a small part of it? Maybe. Maybe. Mm-hmm. I mean, look, PC's from Philly. We from Florida. We don't talk the same. We don't move the same. We And that's just, we all in the same United <laughs> States. So you can only imagine the growing up in Morocco and you talking to him about in the Mozambique. You, you, you reached your limit. <laughs> so what I'm saying is I, I think the argument is the, the way that the clip was presented is good for an introduction point to, to people. I was finna curse. To people that don't know any better. But for those that do, and everybody that I talk to, and I've been starting to read a little bit of the comments, uh, everybody that claimed to be watching the show, they all, I would assume, know all this. So when do we get to that deeper conversation and then even with that we got to have another deeper conversation are we black americans or are we africans and what does it mean to be a because as a black american i it makes sense to say i don't care that's them that's those black people as a pan-african is as somebody that might view yourself as an african in america or any of those other things you care Okay, but you can't do anything caring by yourself. You got to get other people to care. So how do you position the argument in a way that makes it relatable to the people that don't care? You get what I'm saying? Yeah. I mean, I I thought about that when I, you know, when I selected this clip for us to break down, because I understand this. He's talking about the extraction of resources specifically from Africa and how the continent has been dominated for over 800 years. But that has still affected like the Western relationship with the diaspora. So that's what, that's what I was thinking. Even when we say the West though, it's funny because like Senegal is further West in Europe. (laughs) I'm sorry. I couldn't resist. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. (laughs) Couldn't resist. (laughs) But, but, But I'm just like, at when does the conversation get to a depth where we can actually, like, well, that's you know why what I'm we saying? Here. move that's, the needle. That's why we here. That's why, and that's for us to have these type of conversations. So let's have it, my brother. <laughs> well, hey, okay, hey, because because look, you got to get some of this. Um, what I gave PC, you got to get some of this devil's advocate too, right? Since you want to get all heated, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we look at Africa as one country. Yeah, we look at Africa as one nation. Okay. We can do that. So what? Okay. okay. How does that how does that hurt Africa? How does that hurt the image of Africa for us to see Africa as one nation or one country? 
Because we in power. Well, apparently it don't hurt the image. Mm, so, so why they <laughs> mad? So why you mad? Why they mad? Well, well, they they not mad. Black Americans are the ones that's mad. Oh, so what, tell us about it. We we just talked about it. All <laughs> 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 aggressive. I don't, I don't understand. I don't understand the question. Oh, <laughs> least, I don't mess with you because you're aggressive. Good we stuff. just talked about it. Like nah, I don't. But, but the, it's the, go ahead. Go ahead. The the problem with the discussion isn't like one Africans are rarely, if ever, in these conversations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, um, and, and we've talked about this before. They identify themselves more from their culture, um, from that frame of reference, um. And they, they do view the world differently than us. What I saw when I saw the clip was a white man trying to uh, transpose his cultural beliefs and his views onto a group of people that don't have them. So in that, we continue this long line of trying to um, whiteify the culture. You know what I'm saying? Trying to, well, I don't understand why these Negroes don't do this. If I was them, I would do this. Well, you not them. Hey, man. We've been... I, damn it, I, I love talking to y'all, man. Because <laughs> that's another thing that popped in my mind when I was looking at the clip, because I watched a couple times. I like, I, I was waiting to see which one of y'all get to that first. But like, okay, he going to put his whole white views on how we doing this. Oh, yeah, yeah. do your thing. Yeah, my but, but that's something that, like, we always talk about culture, and it's funny. Yeah, it matters. It, it does. Like the way you view the world, the way you view the operations, how you interact with it, all those things matter. Uh, white people have a culture that's hyper aggressive. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Ready for conflict all the time. Let's get at it. So they, he's looking at it from that frame of reference of, okay, like you guys both said, how can I dominate and control? Right. You mm -hmm. got resources. I want resources. How do I get what I want from you with the least amount of effort on my part? And that usually means using my strengths to your weakness. So if I got a big stick and you got a soft head, we finna have a meeting. You know what I'm saying? I'm gonna introduce you to this rock. Right. 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 Well, that's what that's what he got into talking about those European countries being able to re to create the status quo. Um, and um, but, but here's and, the question. And, and I hate to cut you off, but here's no, the question. Ahead. When do we identify the strengths? Because we, we we've gotten real good at identifying the strengths of white people. Mm -hmm. What are the strengths of black people? Uh, when, when do we have that conversation where we talk about yeah, the, well, the strengths of black culture? And I, obviously, we can do it from the perspective of black American culture. But if we're talking about Africa, when do we have that conversation? And this is a genuine question because I don't know the answer. What is the strength of Nigerian culture? What's well, the strength of Cameroonian culture? Before we, before, but before we even get that deep, though, remember, like, you know, like the, the random joke that we have about the, the black superhero and the superpowers of the superhero, right? Right. Because that goes along with what you're asking. And the number one superpower that we give this, this superhero is talking junk. So you're mm -hmm. talking about our strengths as far as like in what area? Because <laughs> it, it's it's like it's a it's a difficult question asking us what well, our strengths are, you know, especially in the I guess that black people have been. I can chime the, in. The, <laughs> Go only, ahead. the only the only recognizable, the only universally recognized strength that I see them attributing to black people is rhythm. Um, the men have big and the women have fat. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's what they how they see it. And I'll tell you, endurance. Unfortunately, because it's, it's a strength and a weakness, and we've had this conversation yeah, before. Yeah, yeah that's adaptability. You know, yeah, adaptability and survival yeah. has been has been 
the traits. Now, if we ever tap into what our strengths could be, then we'd have to overcome our fear to be that powerful. Because I think the, the biggest thing about being that powerful is that then you become a threat to the thing you fear the most. Right. Which is retribution from this Caucasian. And I think that's felt all over anywhere black people are, whether it's America, the continent, anywhere where black people are. Because do you gotta ask yourself <laughs> if if that's not the case, then why hasn't you know um we've been why haven't we been able to sustain any of these liberated pushes? Well, and yeah. go ahead, Joe, I'm sorry. But that that's the part of the that maintaining status quo, keeping that power. Like we're supposed to, they're supposed to to stay on top. That's the idea. And they're the, on and, it at all times. And and they're the master manipulators, uh, right. especially divide and conquer. Because when we go back to the Berlin Conference, what they did was they changed regional lines, they changed tribal lines, and then created internal conflict between people who had at first part had lived in peace with one another for for a millennial. And so you when you destroy that and you fracture those relationships, now you got xenophobia, mm-hmm. which is taking place and, and has been taking place in Africa ever since. Yeah. It's, it's just like the gang warfare we see here. They gang bang over there too. But yeah. on, you know, <laughs> but but it's tribal, it's spiritual, is is I'm not gonna use the word religion, but you can put it there. Yeah, on the cultural lines yeah. and all those things. So it's it's different. So but I think we do need to start identifying the strengths, but and uh, I'm just one of those people that I want to see. I want to. I want us to operate from a place where reality strikes, and reality is addressing addressing all those things that keep us from being to the to, to being the, to, to reaching the the epitome of the strengths we can have. You know, this whole notion of rhythm. The things that nature goes back to the culture of the drum and the spiritual relationship we have with that. And we've been severed from that in many ways. Mm-hmm. Our spirituality is <laughs> our spiritual power. Um I don't know, Pat. I saw you on that walking pad. You was you was you you was in beat. You was well, you was I didn't that. I didn't mean to say I ain't got no rhythm. I meant to say that we are we don't really have no rhythm. I, have you seen these young kids dance? Yeah, these, these, yeah but traditionally <laughs> historically. But now nah, go ahead, PC. <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't mind. mean to say I ain't got no rhythm. <laughs> uh, I mean in my mind, I just saw pictures of the drill videos and all that and, and I didn't <laughs> <laughs> hey, wow, that's catastrophic. <laughs> yeah, I meant to say they ain't got no rhythm. I grew up in the nineties. <laughs> yeah, they, they ain't like us. Uh, so, but you know, they they when when we see it, and we see because it's a, there's a disconnect now in terms of because we write, Pat. You're right. You were you were perfectly right in terms of like the multitude of cultures, multitude of languages. And that took me back to whenever I meet Africans that come to America, and I meet a lot of them, many of them pass through my office, many of them speak six or seven languages. Mm-hmm. And that's because they have to relate to six or seven different tribes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? And so I think that even though they were separate and they had their conflicts, which many of them did, which actually was the cracks in the fissures that actually allowed. Uh, the the Europeans to slip in. A lot of them did have cordial relationships with each other. Now, it's very important that people do understand that Africa is a continent of fifty four countries. Is it fifty four or fifty six now? It's still fifty four. I thought it was fifty seven. Okay. All right. Well, you know, Pat, you the dude. You you. Uh, no, <laughs> you, no, no, no. Joe, Joe is the dude. All right, Joe, well, how many know. is it? I'm gonna look it up. Right. It must. Be. We're gonna we gonna fact check it on the air, y'all. We fact checking. Right. <laughs> I, 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 I want to say nothing because I was like, let me think. 
Let's see. Mm-mm-mm. We all fact checking. Uh, 54. Uh, 54. Uh, 54. Hey, you know, 54. I mean, Make you know, win. Ding, 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 ding. Hey, man. <laughs> Shoot. Uh, but, it, it, you know, we need to. And I guess, typically speaking, either you lull the people to spe- asleep or you beat them enough to the point where they're tired of taking the beatings. And yeah. we're not tired. We're comfortable. You know, and it's scary to think that in countries where, like, like, okay. It's modernization is a European concept in terms of an advancement of culture, an advancement of society. A lot of cultures, there's, the, you know, the island out there right uh, south of India. Where Sri Lanka, I'm that's not sure if is that where they have like the uh the King Kong spears that be taking down choppers. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I forgot, I know the island, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. where that white dude thought he was gonna bring Christianity to him and they beat and they, and they beat him to death and, and dragged him on the beach. Uh-huh. Wait, 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 I ain't hear about that. Uh, yeah. No. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is, was that in the um, Adam and Islands? Um, it might have been. Might, I, the name escapes me. Of the island, there's two islands. Uh, yes. Right. It's two islands. I'm oh, sorry. I'm yeah. sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm not. I'm no, trying to hyper focus. Go ahead. Two islands, but they have not. They have been able to survive with no outside in contact. I think one of the islands let a group in once to do a documentary. Yeah, but the did. other island didn't let anybody in. And if you come close to their shores, they start shooting you with a barrage of really big arrows. In fact, I think that was one of the concepts that led to the movie uh, King Kong with the arrows taking down helicopters because they literally did that. So, but they, in their society, they've been able to thrive for over 100,000 years without being considered. So, so we talk about the modernity and the places in Africa, yeah. it's because the, the narration is always, the narrative is always going to be, well, they're savages because they don't have electricity. They're savages because they don't have uh, what Bluetooth or Wi-Fi, you know. And so they, they, this is why they need us to come in for civilization and to protect and save them and this and the other. But they've been surviving longer than Europe has been standing. Excuses, 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 excuses that they're using, but it's basically like, hey, you know, we gotta we gotta come up with some kind of fancy something to, to say to make it sound good for why we're going in, taking these people's stuff and dominating these people for as long as we do. But we all know that it really come back to where we wanted your stuff and we came in and we took it. We wanted your human capital, we wanted your natural resources, we wanted the land, we wanted the power, we wanted all this stuff, and we came and we took it because we could now. A lot of y'all put up a good fight. A lot of y'all did put up a good fight. But overall, outside of Ethiopia, overall, we were able to get what we need because we talk, go in and thinking of talking about Leopold, like the horrors and the terror that he inflicted upon the people in the Congo. It's just, mm-hmm. it's, it's like that, that man's soul should just be getting ran over by a dump, by a, a garbage truck every day and just garbage juice just dripping on him, his soul every day for all the tragedies and stuff that he's done. Because it's like really understanding the nature and the mindset and the whole behavior patterns of the people who oppress you, people who subscribe to white supremacy, whether consciously or unconsciously. Like our master teachers for years have told us that we are at war and yes, our conditions over here in America or wherever you may be outside of Africa is a bit different, but it's the still, we're still dealing with the same type of people we're using this to understand the behavior patterns, the mindset, how they get down, how they really have been able to build themselves into what they are and the extent that they will go to maintain it. They're willing to do whatever, whenever to maintain it because Hey, if we're going to continue to extract these resources and use the use the labor that we can get exploit these people for their labor and for the resources 
that we're still willing and capable of doing whatever we need to do to everybody else to maintain our status quo. So what you gonna do about it? Mm. Bro. No, we're gonna keep enjoying this electronic and, and we're gonna keep enjoying all this uh you know the the, the of it. <laughs> I mean and that's exactly why I keep saying we need to figure out are we gonna be Africans or are we gonna be black Americans? So we in, we black people in America, so we are black Americans with okay, you know, so no, but on a cultural level. Like exactly. we've got to like right now we we right now we we we're being very we're being very lukewarm to use biblical phrase like we try to have it both ways. Well, well, yeah, because we are we are fracturing ourselves a bit more, especially when it come up to the, a lot of debates and all those different things and mindsets, and ideologies, people defending this and this and that and that and that, people arguing about this and this and that and that and that. So yeah, because. Because if you're going to talk about, and this is for the people that are like, because I've met a few of them on, in my years that are like hypercritical, like, like, I remember this was about six, seven, about seven years ago, I was having a conversation. This is probably the most extreme individual I ever came across on the, um, the black nationalist side of doing business, right? And this individual kept blasting everybody for utilizing resources stripped from African nations. All of the technology and everything. That was just like heavy. And I remember thinking it's, it's just, it's interesting. And you know where I'm going with this. It's interesting that you're criticizing everybody on a cell phone on Facebook. Everything about what you're using to be critical is just, what are you talking about? Well, yeah, yeah. Because we have to understand the relationship that we have with that and some of the roles that we play in that. And like, if you're going to be the moral police, you can't be the moral police like on StreamYard, on YouTube. It's, it's, it's hypocritical, man. And, and we are. And if you care, then then or if you if you feign that you care, then you are it. Because and I had people like brothers would send me videos, right? Pat, you know one of them. Uh, send me videos, brother. That what they're doing to our family in the Congo is is for the Coltan and 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 all the young children and the, there's a new Holocaust going on and nobody's talking about it. I'm like, bro, you sending me your cell phone. You know, and that's just the hypocrisy of it all. And the question is, to if if giving up your uh, if giving up your access to all the things that are used that come from those regions, that are used where the people themselves in those regions are are being tortured or being forced to into this hazardous labor which is taking their lives if you're not willing to give that stuff up then stop talking because i've seen some of these same people over in africa in africa taking selfies like you you're there taking a selfie in africa with, and, and <laughs> with the, with the same technology that you claim is is being is being extracted from from you know so but that that's the extent of the role or the the influence of the west and and the them maintaining where they are because it's we're going to put y'all in the well not necessarily putting y'all but you all are you people are in a unique situation because on one end like you're saying on one end you're talking about we don't like the way that the environment is being treated. We don't like the way you're taking our resources. We don't like the way you're exploiting the labor and stuff. But on the other end, you're not willing to give up your lifestyle. Well, the point that I'm making is that black people need to figure out if we are the West or not. We are. 
but and if we are, we need that. Like that's step one. We need black to people, accept that black people like, in America are the West. Black like people I don't in the UK are the West. But then we need to we need to totally accept accountability in our language. So instead of saying the West does these things, that we need to say we do these things to mm -hmm. Africa. You know what I'm saying? Like like the whole thinking around it needs to shift um, right. if that's the way we're going to be. I position myself as a black nationalist. Got no bones about it. I say it. I'm proud of it. I'm not a pan-Africanist. I understand that's the next step, but I also understand that we ain't there yet and I ain't there either. I'm a black nationalist. That's cool. PC is a pan-Africanist. Cool. You see? You see? You too. No, no. See how that works? Like two people that ain't 100% on the same page and I them heavy. That's my big bro. Don't say nothing crazy. I mean, if you do, I ain't in the comments, so I ain't gonna see it. But out of respect, just don't. I'm sorry, Joe. But anyways, <laughs> um, <laughs> I saw you turn around. Right. So Yo, my fault. I take my note down. <laughs> so, but um, but what I'm saying is, as a as a like my type of black nationalist means that I've had to come to terms with the fact that culturally I'm different from the other yeah. black people in the world. That means yeah. that culturally there are certain things that I view, certain things I say, certain maneuvers I make that are different. But that also means that I benefit from the society that I'm engulfed in. So there are other things there. Am I willing to give up these things if I think it'll make the black community better in America? Absolutely. If I think it'll make the, the, the community better for another group of black people, uh, you know, 5,000 miles away and have no measurable impact on my community here in America. No, I'm not willing to give that up. And you could call me whatever you want to call me. But I think that's just the level of realism that we all have to come to. We have to ask ourselves, what are we willing to give up to help not only the black people in Africa, but black people here and not only the black people here, but the black people in Africa. Those are the types of conversations we need where we're defining the boundaries of our culture, what's acceptable to, what's an acceptable sacrifice and towards what end. And it's real, like, it's really difficult to have those conversations when you don't even have a proper view of yourself in the world, like who you are, where you stand, what are you willing to do for it? Things of that nature. So um, as much of a tech head as I am, if, if I really believe that giving up all of my tech would make things better for black people in America, I throw it all in the dumpster tonight. I can confidently say that because the moment I decided that Facebook wasn't beneficial for me and my community, I jumped off it. The moment, there have been numerous things where I decided, OK, this isn't beneficial for me and my community, at least not the way I utilize it. Because I recognize other people can utilize things a lot better than I can. So the way I utilize it is incorrect. I think the way PC and Joe utilize social media, it works. But the way I was utilizing it, it wasn't working. Okay, so we jump off. There's been other things where I felt like I wasn't, it wasn't beneficial to me and my community. So I threw it away. So like there's a there's a pattern of behavior there. I'm asking other people, like identify your pattern of behavior, because we've talked about what black people are willing to say. I remember this was a few years back. Uh, PC, you might remember. Um, we were I, we were asking people, what are you willing to give up? To Would you be willing to give up your car to create a safe, sustainable, beautiful black community? And people were like, for what? Well, why would <laughs> I have to give up my car though? Well, just in a in a world where we're just going to say giving up your car would create some sort of magical thing or whatever, and the community would be a thousand times better. Would you give up your car? Well, I just don't understand. Like, how would giving up my car do that? Okay, just say you wouldn't. Right. <laughs> That's what it really. Hey, hold on. That's what they really trying to say. Oh, my bad, Joe. 
<laughs> but but that but that go back into like what you were asking originally is how we're going to define ourselves. Who are we? What are we talking about? Like now, of course, like us here on this conversation. Well, we know us three how we identify. We know how some people in the comments identify because they've told us. But through all of this gathering of this information that we have been able to gather, five six different pages on who black people are. You know, um, we still have a contingent of people who believe that we have to reconnect with our African past. We have a contingent of people who we're not black at all. Stop calling ourselves black. Got a contingent of people who think this and think that. So um, I don't I don't know how we get to a point to where we are at least have a tipping point of black people enough for a tipping point to kind of get some kind of forward momentum for us to kind of identify ourselves on the same type of page. But what I do know is another thing that I was thinking when I was watching this clip is that it's really like the, he's, he's, he's talking about a power relationship and he's talking about, well, he also, well, with us, he sparked conversation about, a lot of things that come out of these power relationships, the 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 outcomes, the side effects that come from power relationships, because this the very the very question you're asking is an outcome of the power relationship because you took it because. Yes, we're in different states, but in black people in America, we don't operate as if we're in 50 different countries. We operate as if we're in one country. But within this one country, we have trouble identifying ourselves at all. And that's what I was getting at. And so these are the outcomes of this domination of the continent as a whole, the, dom the, the domination of the minds of the people that come out of the continent, the domination of the status quo, just the domination period of European powers, the countries in Europe being able to have that hold for so long it has really tainted the way we see ourselves and the way we will always see ourselves. And I, you know, at this far, this far into it, I'm going to be honest. I don't know how we come back from that. No, you, you don't, you just got, but in terms of forging future, forging the future, then there has to be a collective, of uh, somewhere, somehow, that see the world the same way, speak the same language, and as the same, you know, uh, the same pedagogy in terms of how we move forward. Because we keep thinking about this like trying to eat a whole pie. But you don't eat a whole pie, you eat a pie one, one bite at a time. And I think we have, I think, actually, you want to be honest about it, in order for us to evolve, we have to leave a lot of this shit behind, a lot of people behind. And so, I'm going to clear something up, too. I'm also a black nationalist, but I happen to also be a pan-Africanist as well. So, as a black nationalist, you cannot operate in the pan nation, the, the pan African theater, unless you have power in the nation that you that you live in. Black people in America have to become powerful in order to handle anything for the rest of the diasporic family. It's like I got enough money to pay my bills, but I can't pay my bills and your bills until I make enough money to pay my bills and your bills. We don't, we, you can't help anybody else while your house is on fire. You can't put out any other, you putting up fires and your house is torched. We, we have to continuously. And like we, we, us, us, we are part of a village. Our village is each other. And then the appendages from that in regards to the rest of our family. 
That's but that's how it folk functions and operates. You can't have a group of people who can't who don't even speak the same language. And I mean, not English or you know whatever language you're speaking. I'm just saying, speak from the same place of of thinking and functioning and not operating. We don't. It's like <laughs> the the biblical tale of Babel, the town of Babel, mm-hmm. and when God said, "You know what." Since y'all are united in sin, I'm going to confuse your language. Now everybody's talking, but they're babbling. Nobody can understand each other. And that's what we got going on with black people. And we all are afraid to deal with our real enemies because this is the one unifying factor. Black people are not united, but we, and I don't think any people in the history of time has ever been truly united on the globe. But I think people understood when it was time to be allies and form allegiances and for the cause of dealing with a common enemy. The one thing black people in America have to deal with, the black people in the Caribbean have to deal with, the black people in South America, South Africa and on the continent and in Europe and even in parts of Asia have to deal with is the same enemy who treats us all differently, but it's all and done in ways to dominate and subjugate us. PC, I'm not going to let you get away with that. You can't what? say, you can't say we are not, there's never been a time in history where we've all been united right after you mentioned the Tower of Babel. Well, like, the Tower of Babel was one right, city. Yeah, <laughs> but, but all the people was united. They were going to build a tower to heaven. They yeah, were yeah. united and they were working towards, so you can't you, unless you try and say the Bible ain't real. No, I'm not, I'm not, well, here's the thing about the Bible. From my perspective, Uh-oh. the Bible is full of truths and there's also some allegories. And I'm not Christian. Far from a Christian. But I believe there's certain things that you can see and do and, and take from each of those historical books. So one of the things that I take from that and I take from the lesson, you're right. But then let's look at that too. They were united because they were going to confront God. So, so, <laughs> so, so we all need a great enemy. I guess white people ain't great enough. We need something bigger. We need aliens. Shit. So, Bro, <laughs> hold on, hold on. What more do you want from me? <laughs> I do want to say I, I the point you made, I just want to um like kind of reinforce it because I do think one of the problems we have is that we keep uh, looking back and we keep trying to undo things and human humans don't grow and develop like that. Like that's not the way humanity works. All of your experiences will come with you always so uh it, it i don't think because joe asked a very interesting question when he said well how do we get back and i don't think there is a going back like pc said is it, there isn't a getting back to anything what we need to do is we need to acknowledge what we've been through and then we need to look down at our hands and decide that yes this is a hand and we can do this with it and then look down in our feet and decide, yes, those are feet. And we can do these things with it. Right. And in that, we begin to develop a common language. And we begin to develop a commonality of tongue and a commonality of expression and a commonality of behaviors. And then by that point, you know, now you got this weird little oddly human group thing called culture starting to be reshaped, reformed, and redeveloped. Except now it's yours. You're not trying to go backwards and retrieve something you already had. You're acknowledging that in this space, you need to figure out how to move for yourself. And that's something that all culture groups do. Black people, the newest culture group on the planet, just got to learn to do it. We got to people, And I think that's a big, a, a great point you just pointed out, too. A lot of these cultures have been around for thousands of years. Black people in America have not. 
And then the fact that black people have literally not truly ever been free to evolve on our own volition. Right. Is telling in terms of like our development here. And I think recognizing that is a big step towards getting to a place where we can develop a new culture. We take the best of what used to work. And then we combine it with what need what we need to do now to become innovative. We did that with PAX. When we came up with our, our code of conduct. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. yeah. And but if 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 we don't choose to change how we contribute to the status quo and even overall change the way we operate, you know, we're all this stuff is falling on deaf ears because what 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 we're talking about, what was just said, everything. We've been watching lectures for this. And our, our, our people tell us this for the last 20 years. But that's the problem. Right. We've been watching lectures, educators, academics. When the last time you truly saw academics get their hands dirty? The people that turn up. Sorry, Joe. The people that turn things up. The people that, uh, you know, uh, the people that cause movements, uprisings, and things of that nature, those are the most uneducated people. But, but, those, but that's what I'm saying. Those people have had access to the lectures as well. What are they doing? What you what we've been doing? They're not watching them. Yeah, the, well, no, I'm talking about, and we're going back to just American history. They didn't really have access to lectures. They might have sat around a fire and said, okay, listen, man, I'm tired of getting my behind beat, and this is what we're going to do. But for the most part, they didn't have that when they were... Well, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, I, 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 mean, I mean, more so like, like, like modern day, like within the last 20 years, 20. That's what I'm thinking about. Like, well, no, but I get what PC is saying, too, because even though we have access to it, the, the movements are like guttural like they're emotional like mm -hmm. you know people get fed up and they move they don't think about how they're gonna that's why the academics are supposed to be inculcating and grooming people at a so when they get fed up and they move they move in a beneficial way so i think you can't really get mad at a at a at a blind for being a blind you can't get mad at a human for being a human People, when they get tired, they're going to move. I think the failure of the academics has been they've been so focused on generating intellectual content that they haven't taken the time to do the other part of their job, which is to translate that into uh, patterns of behaviors and cultural outlooks that drive that emotional movement when it finally happens. Does that make sense? And, uh, yeah. It makes sense. And the and, and we also have to be clear too about something. Our enemy didn't stop being our enemy. Our enemies are active. They've come up with counterintelligence. They've come up with counterplays. They've come Sexy up with red. counterinsurgencies. They, they, I think I made a word up. Uh, they, they've come up with different <laughs> ways to make sure that they stay ten steps ahead of us, and they have spies on our side and infiltrators on our side which will also derail the things we're trying to do. And we know it. We look, we've been in organizations with people like that and whether or not it's the government or whether or not it's something that's been implanted for us to at some point have a person who is so sick that they sabotage the things we're trying to build. We've seen it firsthand to the point where we left a lot of them alone. Well, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> we know we've also said it. No, the, the, the object is to become a threat whether you like it or not, because that's that's actually in the power position to become a threat. But for us, historically, becoming a threat still is a bit different from us because we're, we're looking to become a threat behind enemy lines. Man, we're trying to become a threat with air conditioning. You know what I'm saying? We're trying to become a threat with pop, with, with, with things, uh, leisure and comfort. Now, now, are we going to do the revelation? But first, I got this this trip on a yacht. I'll be right back, y'all. I'm, I'm going on a cruise real quick. When I come back from Cancun, yo, right. the revolution is on and popping. You know, right. when 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 I hold on, y'all. I got a family trip to to uh, Six Flags. When I get back from Six Flags, then we're going to get this thing. We got too many things that that 
We, I mean, look at, let me, let me just break in. And, and like, we just had this thing with Cat Williams and uh, Steve Harvey. That's the type of stuff people get up on. The fact that you got drama between two black men. And that's what, that's, that's what get everybody heightened in the instigation in the comment sections. We have the, the young rappers and all the people who want to get in the comment sections. Like I just brought up this point on my podcast that will be coming on immediately after this. Uh, Mm-hmm. And FetLifeStation.com, same as plug, that when uh you had the, the situation that happened between King, King Vaughn, right? And the other rapper Quando Rondo down in Atlanta where King Vaughn's life was taken, and how because King Vaughn was a, an affiliate and a friend of Little Dirk, that people were literally tagging Little Dirk in the comment sections talking about, yo, what you gonna do about this? Showing pictures of the kid that, that shot, oh, excuse me, that, that hit King Vaughn. Showing pictures of him saying, this is his IG. They tagged both of them in it. Say, Dirk, when are you gonna slide for Vaughn? And pressured him for months until something catastrophic happened in Los Angeles. This is what they get up for. But, this is yeah. what they get up for. Sexy red is okay. Now it's things that this is what we get up for. And we because like we said, we're a young race. People understand black people in America are a young race. No matter how you try to slice it, we are a new creation. Uh so when you think about it, the low vibration culture is stronger than what we've been putting out there but at the same time there's supposed to be a filter a filtration for which those of us who can function and understand what's happening can move differently but the problem is we keep trying to go back and save those people who are very comfortable swimming in waters that are consumed with low vibration and that's why we feel like the problem is insurmountable because we're trying to save people that don't want to be saved. And I've actually yeah. had people come to me and say, for all the work you're doing, I got one question. Did we ask you to? But I, but I think that's a, <clears throat> I think for us as well, though, that's one of the things that we must understand is that's by design. And of course, I'm, I know we understand, but just reiterate, you know, mm-hmm. that's by design. Like, we are the anomalies in this because we're not supposed to be in this mindset. We're not supposed to be these these radicals. We're not supposed to be these free thinkers. We're not supposed to be these people who are bucking against the system. We're supposed to be the the another drone going along with the system because that's the programming that they put into us, that Negro mindset programming. We were able to you know take the red pill and go down a whole nother rabbit hole and come out and having these, having having the ability to think for ourselves and see what's going on with the system and learn more things. So we are the anomalies because we're breaking out of that. We broke out of the mold, but it's by design, all of this. And that's another thing that, that, you know, really comes out of this whole discussion that, that the guy's talking about is it's by design. It's once again, it's the nature of the people that we're dealing with It's how they do what they do because they've always done what they do. Mm-hmm. So the question is, when are we going to do something different? Because they not, because it's been working for them forever. It worked for them against them. Okay. Mm-hmm. I'm just saying. So we got the power if we want to. Yeah. So like you said, FetLifeStation.com, 2 p.m. Tune in. Right after this, go ahead and go over to FetLifeStation.com. Remember, check out thepacks.org to learn more about us as a whole, as an organization, on the shoulders one.com to learn more about on the shoulders of giants. And all the means to support us and contact us is in the description. And you know, keep tuning in and we love y'all. We'll see y'all next time. <laughs>